I'm not beating around the bush. I'm going to be real. I'm going to be honest, and I'm going to rip off the Band-Aid. That being said, who should replace Neil Brown as the head football coach at West Virginia if he were to get fired this season or after the season? Pull up a chair, sit back, relax, and I'll give you my list. What is up, college sports fans, fellow members of Mountaineer Nation? This is Coos, and welcome in to another edition of Coos' Corner. Pull that chair up, and let me serve you up this shot of top-shelf college football content. If you like college football content, especially Big 12 content or West Virginia Mountaineers content, I ask that you please hit that red subscribe button. If you like this video, please hit that thumbs up button underneath. Please share this out with your college sports-loving friends. And last but not least, please drop a comment below and let me know what you think about these five candidates I'm going to give you to replace Neil Brown, and I may even give you a few honorable mentions as well. And I know a lot of you are going to say, Coos, this is too negative. You need to be supporting the program, yada, yada. Well, I'm here to tell you I am going to be supporting the program. I still have tickets to two games this year. I, I do plan on attending those games. And when I'm not attending, I will be sitting in front of my television screen cheering loudly just like I always do. So don't tell me I'm not supporting the program because I am. I'm supporting the players. But at the same time, as a fan and somebody who does invest my money and my time into the program, I feel like we deserve better. We are a top 15 winning program nationally. This is the worst four years, the second worst four year stretch in WVU football history and the worst since since the late 1970s. The worst since Don Nealon was our coach. Ever since Don Nealon took over the program, we've not had a four year stretch this bad in the history of the program. Dana Holgers never had it. Rich Rod never had it. And Don Nealon never had it. And Bill Stewart never had it. Neil Brown has it. So therefore, we need a change of direction. Neil Brown's a nice guy. He's a family man. He has said and done all the right things since taking over the program, but he's not winning enough games. Kansas has now surpassed us. Baylor has surpassed us. Kansas State has surpassed us. Programs that should not be better than West Virginia are now better than West Virginia, and it's unacceptable. And if we as a fan base just sit back and accept mediocrity, then mediocrity is what we're going to get for the rest of the program's life. And I, for one, will not stand for that. And it will also cost them a lot of money because fans will stop going to games and may stop watching on TV. I'm not saying I would, but there are a lot of fans who will. They will get apathetic and won't be as interested. That's how it works. So, therefore, I am going to give you a list of people I think would be good replacements for Brown if he does lose his job either during the season or after the season. Some of these names you will be familiar to you. Some may not. The first name on the list, Jeff Grimes. Jeff Grimes is currently the offensive coordinator for the Baylor Bears. Came to Baylor to work under Dave Aranda when Dave Aranda took over the program in 2020. He took over the offense. It was number 125th in the nation. They, he, in the 2021 season, they were 33rd in the nation. So he, they improved almost 100 spots in offensively with him at the helm of the offense. And what I like best about Jeff Grimes, he was able to take their offense and scheme it and game plan based on the personnel they have. He made the scheme fit the, fit the personnel, not the personnel fit the scheme. And to me, that's what good coaches do. You can't fit a square peg into a round hole. So you take the strengths that you have and you base your offense around it. Last year, they had a strong running game. So what did they do? They ran the football. They had a quarterback, the quarterback that could run in Gary Bohannon. They ran the football a lot. They relied on their defense and the running game what they end up doing? Winning the Big 12 title with that, with that offense. So Jeff Grimes did a great job. Before going to, to Baylor, he was the offensive coordinator at BYU in 2018 through 2020. Also had success there. BYU's offense was 118th in the nation before he took over. He turned it over to 6th in the nation in total offense when he left in 2020. And they were also 4th in the nation in scoring offense when he left. He's coached. He's been the offensive line coach at several Power 5 programs, including Virginia Tech, Auburn, LSU, and Arizona State. So he is familiar with all parts of the country. He, he's familiar with recruiting territory in all parts of the country. And he's also been an offensive line coach, like I stated. So he knows how to get a team playing well on the offensive line. That's been his bread and butter. That's his strength. And we all know for your offense to be good, that's where it all starts is up front. And he's done that successfully as well. Number four on my list, and a guy who might should be higher, Paul Christ. That's right, Paul Christ, the guy who just got fired from Wisconsin only a day ago. I'm recording this video on Monday, October the, the 3rd. He was fired over the weekend. 
shockingly to a lot of people, he was at uh, he had six full seasons at Wisconsin plus five games into the 2022 season. His overall record was 67 and 26. He won 10 games or more in four of his first five seasons at Wisconsin. He had three top 15 finishes at Wisconsin. Overall in his career as a head coach, including three years at Pitt, he has an 86 and 45 overall record. And he was 19 and 19 at Pitt to go along with his record at Wisconsin. I know what you're saying. 19 and 19 is not good. I get it. But his only losing season he ever had was his first season at Pitt when he went six and seven. The other two years, he was either seven and six or six and six. And a lot of what he had at Pitt, you know, he, he was taking over a program that was not in a good spot. So it was very challenging. And he was still able to take them to bowl games every year or at least win six games every year. Speaking of bowl games, seven and two record in bowl games. So he knows how to prepare a team for a big game. He, like I said, he's only had one losing season in his entire career. He's finished ranked in the top 10 twice since he's, while he was at Wisconsin. He's won the Orange Bowl and the Cotton Bowl, also made an appearance in the, in the Rose Bowl. And he has ties to West Virginia, believe it or not. I didn't realize this. One of my loyal uh, followers, Jay Glizzy, one of my subscribers, Jay Glizzy, pointed out to me that he, that he had ties to West Virginia. So I looked it up, and lo and behold, he did. He actually got his master's degree from West Virginia University and was a grad assistant on Don Nealon's staff in the 1989-1990 season. So he probably has a soft place, soft spot in his heart for West Virginia University, I would imagine. He's a Wisconsin guy, was born in Wisconsin, spent most of his coaching career in Wisconsin, and, and got his bachelor's degree at Wisconsin. But he also has attended West Virginia. So he's familiar with the area. He's familiar with the culture. I know he was only here one season, but you got to keep in mind he coached three years at Pitt as well, so he knows the region. He can probably recruit that region. Next on the list, Bronco Mendenhall. Bronco Mendenhall was most recently the head coach of the Virginia Cavaliers in the ACC, spent six seasons at UVA, did not have a great record at UVA. He was 36 and 38. However, he took over a program that was struggling, and he went 2 and 10 in his first year. So that right there hurt his overall winning percentage. He went 2 and 10 in his first year, but by year four, he had him playing in their first ever Orange Bowl. The first Orange Bowl in the program's history, Bronco Mendenhall is the one who took him there. So he was able to turn that program around. Decided to retire after the 2021 season because he wanted to see what it was like to not coach football, basically. Uh, he said he had been coaching for 32 years. He's like he's in his 50s, had, been, had spent almost his entire life coaching football, and he wanted to t take a break from it and see what else was out there for him. But now, according to his podcast, an interview he did on ESPN, he's ready to get back into it again. He said he's refreshed, he's rejuvenated, and he's hungry to take over another program, and he'd love to take over a program he can rebuild because he feels that's where he, his strength is at. I don't know that I'd call West Virginia a rebuild, but I get you know maybe it is. I don't know uh, because we've we've at least been making bowl games. Uh, we're definitely not heading in the right direction. Don't know if it's a full blown rebuild, but I do think Bronco Mendenhall would be a legit guy to at least interview because you know Virginia is not that you know Virginia West Virginia geographic regions are similar. Now he is a West Coast guy. I think spent most of his career in the West Coast. Uh, I think he's from Utah. Spent a lot of years at BYU. He actually had a great record at BYU, turned their program around as well. He had a 99-43 record at BYU and was 6-5 and five in bowl games. His overall record as a head coach is 135-81. and 81. He won two Mountain West Conference championships in his days at BYU before they decided to go independent. Also had three 11-win seasons and never fell below 6-6 six and six while he was a coach at BYU, and that was in his first year. So he had a winning record every year but one, and it was in his first season. So great track record for Bron Bronco Mendenhall. His former players seem to really like him. Uh, could he recruit West Virginia? I don't know, but that's what you have assistant coaches for. Let them let them recruit the areas you're not familiar with. Would he be a cultural fit? I don't know. But one thing, another thing, I do like. He's one of the original. He's one of the original defensive coaches to run a three-three-five scheme, and we all know that's what West Virginia has been running primarily for the last several years. They ran it under Rich Rod, and who, who had Jeff Castile as his D.C. Dana Holgerson ran it when he had Tony Gibson as his D.C., where they're running a version of it now under Jordan Leslie. So he would definitely – he would probably be able to come in and take over this defense without losing – skipping a beat, so to speak. Wouldn't necessarily have to make a lot of changes. So I like the idea of bringing in somebody like a Bronco Mendenhall who has a proven track record as a winner. Number two is somebody you're all familiar with, or at least you should be, and that's Tony Gibson. Former D.C. at West Virginia, current D.C. at North Carolina State. In 2021, North Carolina State ranked second in the ACC in total defense. 
giving up only 19.7 points a game. They were third in the conference in total defense and third in rushing defense. And all that was done without their top defensive player in Peyton Wilson because he was out the whole season with an injury. So kudos to Tony Gibson. We all know when he was at West Virginia, he really had that defense playing at a pretty good level. We, they had a few rough years there, but uh, but, the, but the years that we were good, they were really good. We're one of the top defenses in the league. Tony Gibson's guys always, always play hard for him. His guys always are willing to run through a wall for him and do whatever he asks them to do. And I think that's what we need right now at West Virginia as a coach everybody's going to buy into. And he's a West Virginia guy. He was born in West Virginia, was raised in West Virginia, knows the culture, spent years here as an assistant under Rich Rodriguez, came back as a D.C. under Dana Holgerson, was a grad assistant here, I think, earlier in his career. So just really, really knows the state, the culture, what it takes to win here, and what it takes to get guys to buy in. So I think Tony Gibson is a really logical candidate as well. Last but not least, a guy who's actually rumored to have shown interest in the West Virginia job if it becomes available, and that's current Liberty head coach Hugh Freeze. We all know Hugh Freeze had a scandal uh, after his tenure with Miss, Ole Miss, which I'll get into in a minute, but on the field as a head coach, Hugh Freeze has done really well. At Liberty, he has an overall record of 30-12. and 12. They're currently 4-1 and one this season. Their only loss coming to a 16th-ranked Wake Forest team. They were 16th at the time by only one point. So they're beating everybody they play with, and their only loss is to a really good ranked Power 5 team, a team who's probably going to be in the hunt for another for the ACC title again this year. At Ole Miss, he did a really good job when he was there from 2012 to 2016, compiled a record of 39-25, and 25, beat Alabama two years in a row, one of only three coaches to ever beat a Nick Saban coach team twice in a row. The other two coaches on that list are Les Miles and Steve Spurrier, two coaches who, won, who have won national titles. He took Ole Miss to their first top 10 finish in the final AP poll since 1969. Led them to New Year's Day bowl games for the first time in years. Led them to nine win seasons for the first time in over 30 years. I mean, just a lot of accomplishments at Ole Miss until the scandal hit. There was a recruiting violations that were committed at Ole Miss under Hugh Freeze and before that under Houston Nutt. But unfortunately, Hugh Freeze's staff was part of that, so he got in some trouble. The university got in some trouble, had to vacate some wins, 27 of his wins to be total. So even though his record's 39 and 25 on the field, in the record books it goes down as 12 and 25. But we all know what's happened on the field is what us fans look at. What, what was even worse than that was the fact that during an investigation surrounding all of these recruiting violations, they discovered that he had been using a school-provided phone to make calls to escort services, and apparently he did it for several years. It wasn't just a one-time phone call. It was multiple phone calls over a period of years while he was a coach at Ole Miss. That is not good, and that is not what you want in your head coach. So because of those, those findings, they asked him to step down, and he did. I'm not sure Gordon Gee would be willing to hire you freeze because of those past sins, so to speak, but I'm, I personally am a believer in second chances. I think you give somebody a second chance. Now, since he's been at Liberty, He's gotten in a little bit of controversy there, not quite as bad as what he did at Ole Miss, but there was a there's a there was a female former student at Liberty who was suing. I, I don't know I don't know the whole story, but she was suing either the university and or their athletic department uh, for, because she was claims that she was sexually abused. I'm assuming by a football player or something. Long story short, Hugh Freeze sent her a tweet or a DM or something to her to her account from his personal account basically telling her that she shouldn't be running the athletic director's name through the mud because he's one of the best Christian men he'd ever met. Now, he didn't say anything vulgar, didn't say anything bad, didn't make any threats, nothing like that. But it's not a good idea for a head football coach to be making private messages or private tweets or any tweets, even public tweets for that matter, to someone who is suing the college. I think it's a bad look. He, he should have stayed out of it, stay above the fray, don't even get involved in it. But I don't think that's something that should prevent him from getting another coaching job in the future. I do think, you know, for all intents and purposes, he's he's uh, made amends, has stayed pretty clean at, at Liberty with the exception of that one blunder there. Uh, so with that being said, and I think he can win football games. I, Gordon Gee is really, really big on, on appearance and culture and being a great representative of the program, so I'm not sure he would be willing to hire Hugh Freeze. But I have heard rumors Freeze has shown interest.
So we'll see if that means anything or not. But we all know right now Neil Brown is still our coach. And until he's fired, none of this is really going to matter anyway, If he, assuming he is fired. Now, some honorable mention names I'll run through real quick. I've heard Jimbo Fisher brought up. I don't think it's a good idea. I think Jimbo Fisher's best days are behind him. I'm not sure he – I mean, his offenses at Texas a are not looking good right now. He's bringing in top ten recruiting classes and still only winning about eight games a year. So what would he do at West Virginia? Uh, number two, I've heard Rich Rod coming back. I don't think that's a good idea. I'm not a big fan of recycling old coaches. It typically doesn't work. It hasn't worked for Rucker so far. It didn't work for UConn when they brought Randy Edsel back. It's not working for North Carolina with Mac Brown. I think you need somebody fresh, a fresh face, to try something new. I'm not a fan. I'm not. I have nothing against Rich Rod personally. He did great when he was here. And two, Rich Rod hasn't really had all that much success since he left West Virginia. Maybe he caught lightning in a bottle with Pat White and those guys. Who knows? But I'm not a huge fan of bringing back an old coach. I've heard other names. You know, Deion Sanders. I don't think Deion Sanders is, would even sniff a job at West Virginia. If he ever wants to go to the Power Five level, he's going to take a job much higher on the food chain than West Virginia. He's probably going to want a blue blood program or at least something where he feels like he'll have a better shot to recruit higher talent, higher caliber players. You know, there's been a lot of other names brought up. Bo Pelini. Not sure I, I'm a huge Bo Pelini fan. Anyway, that, that's just a few names that I've heard mentioned. But that being said, let me know, Coos Corner family, leave a comment below. Let me know, do you, do you like any of the five coaches I mentioned? Is there another coach I didn't mention? Do you like one of the coaches I don't mention? Heck, do you think Jimbo would be a good coach? Do you think Jimbo would be a good addition here? Let me know your thoughts. He is a West Virginia guy, but I don't like getting tied up in that. Yes, it's an advantage. It's a piece of the puzzle, but we cannot – put ourselves into a box by only taking West Virginia guys. Don Nealon wasn't a West Virginia guy when we hired him, and he did pretty good here, wouldn't you think? So don't let's not put ourselves in a box to where we have to hire a West Virginia guy, okay? So with that being said, I want to know your thoughts. Don't forget to check out my merch store. I'll leave a link at the top of the description box. If you want to join Coos's Corner, become a member, don't forget I'm going to be doing a raffle here real soon. Only channel members will be in the raffle for a prize. Country Roads level members will get one entry into the raffle. Mountaineer Maniac level members will get two entries into the raffle, so a higher chance to win. If you want to take advantage of that, join my channel now, and you'll get other perks along with it as well. Early access to videos, some members-only live streams, things of that nature. Last but not least, the four free ways you can support me. Like the video, share the video, leave that comment, and last but not least, help me get to 5,000 subscribers by hitting the subscribe button if you've not yet subscribed. And with all that being said, I really appreciate you, your support and for watching this video. And until the next one, Q Country Roads.